we've been asked to say something about the kind of operative terms of the book, um, Anatheism and Theopoetics. So maybe I could start by saying sure. a few words about Anatheism, and you could pick up then and uh, say a few clarificatory remarks about Theopoetics. Um, two new terms, I'd say, for a lot of people. So anatheism basically was a term which I used in previous books, as you know, particularly um, anatheism. <laughs> uh, and it simply means, as you know well, uh, the, the idea of what, if anything, comes after the death of a certain kind of god in our civilization, sort of the god of power and might, the god of superintendence and theodicy and punishment. And um, a god declared dead by Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche, and others, the Enlightenment. So the question then would be, well, after the death of that kind of God, which arguably is a caricature, uh, what still remains? What, what still remains of our scriptures, of our traditions? Uh, so you could have an anatheist Christianity that basically retrieves the, the essence of Christianity, the God of, 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 of healing, the God of uh, openness and hospitality to the stranger, the God of uh, the least of these, as Jesus says he is in Matthew 25. And ditto, you know, you could have an anatheist Judaism that goes back to Abraham uh, and Sarah welcoming the strangers. Um, and ditto for, for Islam uh, or any other religion. Any religion can be anatheist in that sense. And it's not a dogmatic theism or a dogmatic atheism, but something that, as it were, precedes that polar opposition and that supersedes it. So it gets people to rethink, right? Right. And the very I, notion of religion and God. And I think a question that immediately arises is how do you return to a more authentic relation to the divine mm. after the death of this type of God? And so the term theopoetics is mm. uh, p potentially a way back to mm. return to this type of God through God, Theo, mm. through poetics, poesis, creation mm. through the arts. Mm. So how is it that artistic creation, how is it that our engagement with the arts can in some way be an opportunity to open on to the divine, open on to a retrieval of faith, a retrieval of the experience, the raw experience mm. of the surplus or something more or the divine, the sacred in everyday mm. life. Mm. And isn't there something in the very notion of art that suggests poesis as making? Right. And Theopoesis, Theopoetics, as it first arose sort of in the 4th, 5th century, was this idea of the human making the divine and the divine making the human. So that if in Genesis, God makes the world and makes humans, Adam and Eve, um, out, of, out of mud and clay, so too human beings born in the image and likeness of that God maker, that God creator in making, are actually following the vocation and calling of the divine to complete the seventh day of creation by remaking the world in their image and likeness. Absolutely. So the creativity of God then opens up to the creativity in human beings, which calls for an ongoing process of making and remaking, recreating, recreating even our encounter with the divine. So uh, how is that encounter uh, accessed and experienced mm. through making itself, mm. through artistic creation and, and human creation. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's interesting that at one level in the biblical tradition, there is a prohibition on making images. Right. And yet we're told that we're made in the image and likeness of God and that that image is, is an image of cre creating. The, the yetzer, as they say in Hebrew, is the, is the imagination. So we have a calling, according to the scriptures, to make and remake the world and therefore to complete the seventh day of creation, which was left empty, the Sabbath. Right. God did not complete that. In, and if, if he, it, she had completed the seventh day, we would simply be sort of puppets right. um, and would have nothing to do but, but say yes. But we have the, the, the freedom to say yes or no by co-creating the kingdom with the divine call or not doing so. That's the invitation that's open, the possibility of joining in the co-creation, or as you rightly say, uh, rejecting that mm. possibility. Mm. That freedom is left up to us. Mm. So artists and the art works that are discussed in the book, would you like to, say, to mention one or two of those that 
sort of epitomize and exemplify this kind of process of theopoetics? Sure. Well, I think what, what's really unique about the book, to me, it's certainly um, unique for the type of scholarship that I've been involved in and the type that I read, is that it brings together not just scholars, not just philosophers and theologians, but artists themselves. So we have painters, we have musicians, we have poets, and even uh, aspects of the book, I think, in some ways represent not just uh, an exploration of theopoetics, but actually uh, instances mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. theopoesis in action. Mm -hmm. So the book itself includes uh, a beautiful poem at the end by Fanny Howe, the poet, mm -hmm. which in some ways embodies, encapsulates what, what the book itself is trying to explore, what mm -hmm. some of the other essays are trying to explore. We have Sheila Gallagher, who you know is a, is a wonderful artist, uh, and she wrote a beautiful piece on the artistic creation that goes into gardens mm -hmm. and gardening mm -hmm. and the art of cultivating the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, we bring together musicians. Can I just come in before sure. you come to the musician? Yeah, yeah. Just a word on, on Sheila Gallagher, who, who is also a faculty member here at Boston College. Um, her piece, which I actually discuss in, in my opening chapter, mm -hmm. Pneuma Hostess, is, as you know, um, a, a host, a monstrance from the benediction made in a, from gold leaf uh, cigarette butts. Mm. The idea being that the least, um, the least of these, uh, uh, you know, the discarded bits and pieces of detritus on the street, cigarette butts, mm. uh, can actually be retrieved and redeemed as well uh, in their littleness and, and their brokenness. And from that very remnant, uh, this beautiful monstrance can be created. Right, and when we start thinking about art... Which is art, an incarnational image, you know, the divine in the very flesh of the world. Absolutely. And when, when we think about artistic creation and art itself, it kind of raises the question, well, what, what is art? What mm -hmm. constitutes art? And what Sheila does so beautifully with her art, and I think what the book itself is trying to pick up, is that there's an artfulness of everyday living, that every experience is open to the possibility of being understood artistically mm -hmm. and Transfigured. Transfigured, mm -hmm. uh, open to the possibility of an encounter with mm -hmm. the divine through the remaking of your own life, yeah. everyday experience in an artistic manner. It's very Nietzschean in a way, uh, an existentialist. T totally, totally Nietzschean. Yeah. That, that it's life not is elitist, I mean, in the sense that it's not just confined to painters and poets and playwrights. It's everybody who can do this. No, your own life can be lived as a work of art. Mm -hmm. And that living your life as a work of art opens onto the possibility of the question of an encounter with something greater than the human, something sacred. Absolutely. And uh, I did interrupt you earlier when you were mentioning uh, others beside the painters, because there's also Kate Lawson, who's a practicing painter, and she shows her work and discusses work on uh, anatheism in a Buddhist uh, uh, tradition, uh, Buddhist theopoetics. And this is one of the things, too, that I think makes this work unique is that, uh, and the concept anatheism unique, is that it's not exclusive. It's not about one specific tradition. It's about how can uh, our engagement with the divine also retrieve what is best in each of our own traditions, and how can we experience that through the mm. traditions of another without sacrificing our traditions. Right. So how can a Christian be influenced by Buddhist art right. and the, the Buddhist encounter with the divine, and, the and vice and versa? And the Hindu and so on. Of course. And there's also room for the atheist who has a sense of the sacred, right. but doesn't necessarily want to put the name of a particular god of a particular religion on it. Well, Nietzsche is a perfect example. The, Nietzsche is very, very spiritual and an atheist, but he's open to the sacred encounter in human mm. creation, human interaction on the human plane. And I think that that comes through in this work. And also clearly. in the earth, in a way. Absolutely. You know, there's an ecological element in, in, in many people who have a sense of the sacredness and the divine sacredness of nature, which is so <laughs> under threat in our world today. But other examples of art, uh, which I think are worth maybe mentioning yeah. here, are uh, the, 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 the piece by Stephanie Rumspa, a young scholar on three films, contemporary films, including Scorsese's uh, Silence, mm -hmm. uh, Murray Littlejohn's piece, another, an, another young, brilliant scholar, Sacred Songsters on the sense of the sacred in Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen and the Beatles, and Bono, mm -hmm. you too. Um, and uh, there's a number of people writing about artists and writers like um, Cormac, Robinson. Cormac McCarthy, Cormac McCarthy comes in. Yeah. And I think, what's, Rambo, yeah. I think what's great is that we have uh, both very, very prolific and established scholars, uh, Caputo, Catherine Keller, John Manasakis, 
And that comes together with Jean-Luc Nancy. Nancy. Mm -hmm. And that comes together with uh, kind of the next generation of scholars. I mean, I myself was so honored to be involved in this project. But I think that it's the notions that are at the center of this project also bridge the gap between generations mm -hmm. of thinkers mm -hmm. in a really interesting way. So we have kind of new thinkers who are engaging with this in exciting ways and kind of the established thinkers who find ways even to tie this notion into their own thought mm -hmm. or, or Nancy who resists in some ways yes. this notion and is open yeah. to it in other ways. So there's yeah. critical engagement. And conflict as well as... Absolutely, not everything is... Agreement and concert. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. so there's a there's a very deeply interreligious sense that you've mentioned. Absolutely. Uh, there is a, an interdisciplinary sense. We're doing theology, philosophy, literature, the arts. Um, and also this kind of a sense of, as is appropriate if we're talking about poetics, yeah. <laughs> the play. It's yeah. been fun. It's been fun working together as editors, yeah. but also with these very creative people, particularly from the younger generation. Yeah, and, and I've been inspired by, I mean, it hasn't always been my experience uh, as, a, as a young scholar mm -hmm. that the collegiality and the friendliness and the, in, the real genuine curiosity and interest mm -hmm. that the contributors to this piece showed in coming together, working together, grappling with ideas, debating ideas, mm -hmm. it really has been a fun process, yeah. which is not the norm. Yeah. And it was very nice at the end, and, and this is a credit to, to our University of Boston College, when uh, we didn't have a budget for visuals, yeah. and given the fact that so many artists and filmmakers and, and painters and so on are involved in the book, that he came up with support for very beautiful illustrations and in color. In color, yeah. which I think really made the book mm -hmm. in some ways that much better. We got mm -hmm. to see the art that these thinkers and artists are engaging with, mm -hmm. and then on the page you can experience what they're talking about mm -hmm. in bright, beautiful color. Yeah. I think that one of the reasons that I was excited about taking on this project and coming to you and, and trying to get together a group of thinkers is that I saw how many people were already engaging with your work, Anatheism, and I saw the possibility of bringing it together with the artistic notion, which is already implicit in Anatheism, but this makes it explicit. What's the tie between the notion of Anatheism and artistic creation. I mean, in, in Anatheism itself, you have poets, you have uh, Blake, you have uh, Keats. Joyce, Keats. Mm -hmm. That's already uh, Keats, an yeah. implicit part mm -hmm. of the notion itself. Mm -hmm. But I think what really is exciting about this work is the further development yeah. of the idea of Anatheism, mm -hmm. specifically in the realm of uh, aesthetics and making. Mm -hmm. And, and the visual arts, and the visual which arts. were not present in the earlier books on anatheism, such as Anatheism, Returning to God After God, right. uh, which was, I think, 2011 or something, and then uh, Reimagining the Sacred, which was really more a dialogical book. But if there were examples from art, it was almost exclusively literature, right. very rarely right. film or music or the visual arts. Right. Or, our, or liturgy. Or, or liturgy or our right. virtual culture, because that's one of the discussions, what happens to art when it goes virtual when we're right. talking about simulations images as simulations right in our in our viral virtual culture and i think it just shows the fruitfulness of the idea that it opens so directly onto engagement not just with everyday experience but with the things that make life so interesting and valuable and worth living which which a lot of times is the arts um so for me this was a very fruitful project to see this as a furthering of something that I've already admired in your work, but taking it in a new direction or exploring things that were maybe there, fertile, ready to be dug through, actually in a very creative way, in the same way that the book itself is advocating this creativity, I found that this to be a work of scholarship that was very creative and fruitful in that same way. Well, I, uh, I know one of the questions we were asked in doing this interview was to maybe say how it affects our teaching yeah. And I found that teaching interdisciplinary um, core classes mm -hmm. called Enduring Questions, where I work with an artist like Sheila Galler or an historian like Rob Savage, I speak as a philosopher, that uh, it lent itself to that sort of crossing of disciplines and idioms. And it's been very exciting for me, actually, as a teacher who always taught just straight philosophy, yeah. Yeah. to actually engage in conversations with um, scholars and artists from other disciplines. And yeah. I think uh, my, my, my sense is 
that the students really get a lot out of that. Well, I, I came to philosophy, I was an English major as an undergrad, so I kind of came to philosophy with this idea that literature and philosophy dialogue very well, mm -hmm. which again, your original work kind of explores the relation between these philosophical mm -hmm. ideas and the literature that kind of in some ways plays them out. But after uh, working on this project, I found myself pulling in a lot more visual arts mm -hmm. into the classroom. Mm -hmm. In particular, uh, film is such a, a massive medium that students are engaging with Netflix. You know, it's, it's what they do outside of class. And so then to be able to pull in TV shows, movies, whatever, uh, in the classroom in ways that show that there are ways to think about these things and engage and with them. And very contemporary ways. Yes. Because the contemporary culture and consciousness is very interdisciplinary. Absolutely. And the academy has resisted that for a long time. But I think it's now coming around and we're speaking the language of our students. And they're learning to speak our language, you right. know, sort of in a reciprocal way. I know that any any public lectures I, I do now, I almost invariably use uh, video, music, um, some kind of multimedia presentation to or, you know, visual projections to to comment on the work. I don't really use PowerPoint, but I do tend to use music, uh, the visual arts and film. And I think I think part of the question for me in teaching undergrads is always, uh, what I try and think about as a, as a teacher is why should they care about what I care about with mm -hmm. philosophy? Why should they care about what I do and think about? Yeah. And to show them that the things that they're already doing in their daily lives, particularly mm -hmm. through visual media, through mm -hmm. the arts, through film, through music, that those things can be thought about, grappled with, experienced in new ways is what I see brings excitement to the classroom for them and for me and so that's what this type of project is trying to open up to scholars as well like w there is these things inform our lives mm. these thoughts these ideas are not separate mm. from how we live our lives right and also they involve pleasure right. and fun right which is what aesthetics allows us to celebrate right and, and what I mean we keep going back to Nietzsche but what Nietzsche says philosophy should be doing yeah. it should be the gay science the happy science we should be joyful people practicing this art yeah. well it's been a joy working with you on the book Matt thank you as always Richard <laughs>